Good afternoon. Welcome back to Codex. Many, but not all of our talks this summer feature graduate students and postdocs who were nominated to speak by their senior colleagues. Today, we're very happy to have Victor Coney be the next speaker in this series. Vicky mm -hmm. is currently a graduate student in the Department of Informatics and Telecommunications at the University of Athens. She is advised by Professor Theo Harris, Theo, Har Theo Harris, working on a thesis titled Compressed Sensing and Sparse Representations in Imaging Sciences. And she's graduating in September 2023, so coming up. Uh, we're very excited to have her here today to tell us about analysis compressed sensing from model-based methods to deep unfolding networks. Take it away, Vicky. Thank you, John, and thank you all actually for the nice invitation to your very, very nice uh, seminar. So today I'm going to talk about signal processing techniques and how to combine them with uh, deep unfolding networks, uh, especially. So um, I have split my presentation in two parts. Both of them are about compressed sensing, but in the first part, we're going to see model-based things. I'm going to briefly introduce what is uh, compressed sensing and sparse data models. And then we're going to see uh, some spark deficient Gabor frames, one in particular, and present some uh, known results and test these results on uh, numerical experiments and then sum up and see some future work. And on the second part, we're going to see how compressed sensing can be combined with uh, deep learning through the so-called uh, deep unfolding uh, networks. And we're going to develop a new deep unfolding network for compressed sensing and also study its generalization error bounds. And in the end, we're going to see some numerical experiments confirming our theory and again, sum up and see some future work. So without further ado, I will introduce you to what compressed sensing is. So in a nutshell, Compressed sensing is a signal processing technique that deals with recovering a signal, say, X here from incomplete and perhaps noisy measurements Y. And in order to work things out, compressed sensing relies on two principles. First, the so-called measurement matrix A must satisfy some conditions that ensure exact or at least approximate reconstruction of X. And then, we also impose a sparse data model for our signal of interest. But what sparse uh, data models do we have? One may wonder. OK, so actually, we have two of them. Uh, the one known by far uh, is the synthesis sparsity model, in which case we consider that X is synthesized by a few uh, elements of the so-called uh, dictionary D, or in other words, synthesis operator here. And the synthesis representation of X, that is S here, is considered to be sparse. In other words, it has very few non-zero elements. Uh, and or in some cases, we may also consider orthogonal or unitary matrices uh, T. On the other hand, we have uh, its, let's say, analysis twin, in which case the, uh, the signal of interest X becomes sparse after the application of an adequate analysis operator, as we call it W, and in that case, the analysis representation of X, that is Z here, is sparse. Now, the funny thing, let's say, is uh, when these two models uh, coincide, and it is exactly the case where all the dimensions are equal, and W is simply the uh, inverse of D. However, the interesting case, uh, which is uh, the one that we are going to uh, consider in this talk, is a case that uh, we have redundancy. And by redundancy, I mean that the, uh, the number of rows in W, it's uh, in some cases even much more than the other dimension. So in this case, the two models actually differ and sometimes differ a lot. So in optimization language, if we inject analysis sparsity in compressed sensing, we are going to solve the analysis L1 minimization problem, which I have written here in one. And in plain language, it means that you must uh, have uh, the sparsest representation uh, of X after applying W, so that the incomplete and noisy measurements are satisfied. 
Now, one may wonder, okay, I have synthesis sparsity, it's uh, well studied, uh, we all know it, so why do I even bother with analysis? And I'll tell you what. Uh, related work has shown that there are advantages of analysis over synthesis sparsity D. For example, uh, one may leverage uh, the redundancy of the involved analysis operators uh, when employing analysis sparsity, because analysis sparsity provides flexibility in modeling sparse signals. And the actual optimization uh, when using analysis sparsity takes place in the open space, so it looks computationally more appealing. And the optimization algorithm may also need less measurements for particular construction, so we also may have a lower computational cost. With all this in hand, one may also wonder, uh, okay, well, uh, what analysis operator should I use? And I'll also answer that question. Because uh, related work has also uh, shown that uh, analysis operators associated with full spark frames do save the day. But the thing is that the full spark uh, property is not very beneficial when it comes to analysis run minimization. And the reason for this is that full spark restricts the amount of linear dependencies in the analysis operator. Uh, so we could, we could have uh, a bigger amount if we could leverage the uh, redundancy here, and then analysis L1 minimization could also uh, work things out. So uh, considering all this, we opt for analysis operators exhibiting much more uh, linear dependencies among the rows. And the reason uh, we do all these things is to introduce spark deficient cover frames, which is uh, a very interesting topic in this talk. And the reason we employ them is because uh, these frames have enhanced linear dependencies. And one may also wonder, okay, why Gabor? We may also explore other frames. Yes, but uh, Gabor frames are a little explored in terms of analysis, yes. And by analysis, yes, I mean specifically the sparsifying uh, framework. So uh, we use spark deficient Gabor frames. We associate to such a frame a highly, in some cases, redundant uh, Gabor transform, as we also call this analysis operator. And then we perform some molecular experiments to compare the proposed transform to three other state-of-the-art Gabor transforms and test also some uh, our framework with different pairs of large parameters. So our results indicate that the proposed transform outperforms all the baselines for both synthetic and real-world signals and also for different sets of large parameters. And on top of, the, of all that, the interesting uh, part, which tends to uh, number theory, is that all transforms achieve their best performance when the latch parameters are the two largest primes in the prime factorization of uh, each signal's uh, dimension. So um, after this brief, uh, let's say, introduction, we should see what a discrete uh, Gabor system is. So a uh, Gabor system is simply a collection of time frequency sets of uh, the so-called window vector G, which uh, are written here. And as you can see, P and Q are time frequency shift indices. And A and B are the so-called time frequency or else uh, large parameters. And uh, some notes regarding uh, these elements is that uh, if the discrete Gabor system with uh, elements having this form spans the whole number space, then this system is a Gabor frame for uh, CN. And also in that case, we have that the product of the large parameters is less than the ambient dimension. Moreover, the number of elements is uh, the ambient dimension squared over the product of the large parameters. And another thing is that this uh, A and B here play a crucial role in the signal's good time frequency resolution with respect to uh, chosen Gabor frame. And with all these hands, we can now define what the uh, Gabor analysis operator, or as I will uh, tend to call it from now on, uh, digital Gabor transform uh, GTs, which is simply uh, given by these uh, inner products here of uh, the uh, signal of interest with the Gabor frame elements. 
And after all these uh, very interesting things, the uh, next uh, thing to explore, which is also a very uh, uh, important thing on this topic, is to define what the spark of a frame is. So the spark of a set, let's call it phi, uh, of n vectors and capital in CN is the size of the smallest linearly dependent subset of phi. And we also call a uh, frame v full spark if and only if every set of n elements of this frame is a basis, or equivalently, we may also say that its spark is the amber dimension plus one. And in, other, and in any other case, it is spark deficient. And now, is now a little bit of algebra because we're going to need it later on. So the splectic group here denoted by SL consists of all the matrices uh, two times two with elements in the ring of residues modulo n. And to each such matrix corresponds a unitary one, which is given by the explicit formula here in phi. But the thing is that we defined all this stuff because we are going to uh, restrict ourselves to a specific uh, uh, matrix of this symplectic group, which is the so-called Zauner matrix written here. And of course, it has a corresponding unitary Z, which can be uh, derived from this formula here in five, as I saw earlier. So we have this uh, really nice theorem, which uh, to tell you the truth, I prefer to translate it in my own language because it was a very algebraic terms which I didn't uh, very much understand. So uh, in plain words, let's say that we have uh, a natural number n, which is divided by three, not divided by two, and it is a square free uh, natural number. Then any eigenvector of the Zauner unitary matrix generates a spark deficient Gabor frame for CN. And this theorem is really, really useful because we're going to use it later on on our numerical experiments. But the thing is, okay, we have the experiment, but the uh, theorem, sorry, but uh, while well, we have to choose uh, somehow an ambient dimension, we cannot just uh, proceed uh, uh, with uh, the hope that something comes up. So um, rather interesting and easy thing to do is to uh, employ the prime factorization uh, for the ambient dimension. So let's say I want to take k prime numbers, uh, which should also be chosen accordingly to the theorem so that one of these prime numbers must be number three and the rest must not be equal to two. And of course, all the prime, uh, uh, the powers of the prime numbers must not be a multiple of two. And then we can uh, result in, uh, in a number like this one written here. And since the lattice parameters also divide the ambient dimension, we can also uh, choose the lattice parameters through this prime factorization. And now that we have the ambient dimension and the lattice parameters, we can proceed with uh, the theorem I saw earlier about the spark deficient couple frames. So we first uh, take the prior aspect of the composition of the uh, unitary Zauner matrix. Then we can select an arbitrary eigenvector of the unitary Zauner as a window vector to produce a spark deficient couple frame. We call this window vector star window. We denote it G star from now on. And this uh, G star window generates the so-called star digital couple transform. So now we have uh, all the uh, necessary tools, we can proceed with applying uh, the proposed RDGT to three other uh, couple transforms which are generated by state-of-the-art window vectors in time frequency analysis. So we perform experiments on two synthetic real-valued signals and two real-world speech signals. And in the upcoming figures, you're going to see how the relative uh, reconstruction error decays as the number of measurements increases for uh, uh, two different synthetic signals. And here with the blue dots is the proposed study GT. And the rest uh, dots is uh, for um, a Gaussian, a Han, and a Hamming uh, window. And as you can see, the star DGT outperforms uh, all other DGTs 
in the whole range of measurements. And if it's stable, I did that number theoretic uh, thing I mentioned earlier in the beginning, where I pretty much uh, uh, applied the star GT along with the uh, rest of the GTs on knowledge cell one minimization. And here I have the relative error for uh, two uh, real world speed signals, where as you can see, I denoted with a bold uh, font the star window since this is the one that outperforms all the others. And now comes the interesting part where we see that among all the choices of the large parameters, all these transforms achieve their best performance when uh, we have these uh, particular two last prime numbers in the prime factorization of the ambient dimension which I think is really cool because uh, I, as I told you earlier in the annotation, let's say, we know that uh, we have to experiment numerically with uh, large parameters in order to have a good time frequency resolution. But uh, seems that uh, uh, something could come up during uh, these experiments. And uh, well, in that slide, I simply uh, gather all these things I already told you about. And now in order to see what we did here and uh, see what's coming next. So we employed a window vector to generate a spark efficient Gabor frame. We associated a uh, redundant, uh, especially highly redundant, in some cases, analysis operator, that is star DGT, and compared the latter to three state-of-the-art GTs by solving the analysis of minimization problem for both synthetic and real world data. Our experiments confirmed the improved performance because the increased amount of linear dependencies we got from this uh, uh, spark deficient Gabor frame resulted in a lower reconstruction error as the number of measurements increased. So for future work, I'd say that I would really like to study and uh, develop a mathematical framework in order to explain why star Gabor transform benefits more when the large parameters are chosen as the two largest primes in the prime factorization of the ambient dimension. And that was the first part. So we're heading towards the second and uh, the one that I'm currently uh, working on. So uh, what we know from model-based compressed sensing is that it is well studied in the last decade or so. And we have many theoretical guarantees explaining why it works so great. But the uh, sad part is that we need many iterations to converge to a solution of the problem. And of course, we have high time complexity. And we also get a low quality of the reconstructed signal even if we have uh, a number of measurements equal to uh, half of the ambient dimension. But, okay, uh, all these things uh, may be good and bad, but we have also a nice uh, new alternative, which are the deep neural networks. And we know that uh, deep neural networks offer higher reconstruction quality in a significantly faster way. So one may wonder, okay, so why don't we combine the interpretability of model-based methods with the power of uh, deep neural networks? And good news are that we do have this thing and it is called deep unfolding, which uh, basically consists in interpreting the iterations of well-known optimization algorithms as layers of uh, deep neural network, let's say here uh, for convenience fee. So this fee implements a function, let's call it H, that serves as a decoder, which means that it is a function uh, that feeds it with this measurement vector here, y, and outputs a, a vector x hat, which approximates the original signal of interest x. And this phi is called deep unfolding network. Now, related work is uh, pretty much uh, about uh, the following networks based on uh, the iterative of holding algorithms or the alternating direction method of multipliers. And basically, such uh, different folding networks jointly learn a decoder for compressing and a specifying transform. And there are also some uh, recent studies 
on the generalization error of uh, unfolding networks. But the disadvantages of all this uh, all this stuff is that the learnable stratifier typically satisfies some orthogonality constraint. So the compressed sensing problem is solved under the synthesis sparsity model. And we also have a generalization error bounds only for the synthesis-based unfolding networks. But there is one uh, set of the art unfolding network that solves uh, the analysis compressed sensing problem. Um, but in any case, uh, it, it is not accompanied by any generalization error bounds, which is, well, okay, let's say half work. So in this talk, we're going to see and develop a new unfolding network coined the coding network. From now on, it's simply uh, called Deconnect. And Deconnect jointly learns a decoder for compressed sensing and a redundant sparsifying analysis operator. So as you can see in this case, we employ analysis sparsity instead of its synthesis counterpart, which as I have already told you, it may turn to be more beneficial in many cases. So we also estimate the generalization error of Deconnect using a chaining technique. And to the best uh, of our knowledge, we are the first to formally study the generalization error of an analysis-based unfolding network for compressed sensing. Moreover, our theory uh, implies that the generalization error bound we have uh, scale like the square root of uh, n time cell, or n is simply the redundancy of the sparsifier, and l are the total number of layers. And that was from the mathematical part. We also explore the experimental case where we assess the validity of our delivered theory and compare Deconnect to state-of-the-art unfolding networks on real-world image data. And from our experimental results, we see that Deconnect uh, has a, a generalization error which scales correctly with uh, the theoretical findings. And also, Deconnect outperforms both baselines consistently for all datasets. And now let's begin with the algorithm we are going to uh, unfold as a neural network. So first, uh, the original paper from which we took uh, the uh, optimization algorithms uh, it was one of the guys who developed the TFOX package for those of you who also get their hands dirty with uh, MATLAB experiments. So these guys take the analysis of minimization and transform it into a smoothed one. And I call it smooth because uh, they actually add the smoothing parameter here, me. And of course, they also have uh, an X0, which is an initial guess on the signal of interest and an estimate on the noise level. And then they associate uh, to the smooth analysis one minimization, it's dual, which is uh, the one written here in eight. And after a collection of arguments and calculations, they derive algorithm one, which from now on I will call it for convenience as uh, ACF. And here's the algorithm. Don't panic from what you see because I know it's uh, quite big. I'll just uh, sketch uh, what we see here. So we have these dual variables, Z1, Z2. The corresponding step sizes, we also have a step size multiplier here. And then the algorithm also inserts uh, two extra dual variables, u1, u2. And this uh, t and s calligraphic here are simply the soft thresholding and truncation operators. So a few notes before we continue. Um, you may trust me or you may, you may not, but the uh, original paper says that this ACF is guaranteed to converge to a solution x hat of the smooth analysis L1 minimization problem. And uh, for which we have that this uh, solution tends to uh, the original X hat. And the optimal solution X hat is identified to uh, this uniquely determined value X hat me in some cases. And it is argued that there are situation, situations where these two X hats coincide. 
So from now on, we stick to the formulation of the original paper and speak only about the solution X hat. So now that we see how this uh, ACF algorithm looks like, we can uh, start developing the corresponding unfolded network. So we consider first a standard scenario for the ACF algorithm. And uh, we concatenate all the dual variables in one vector. Let's call it here uh, V. And we do some uh, mumbo jumbo mathematical calculations. And then we get these uh, interesting things here, nine. And don't be afraid of all these uh, uh, terminology here. You might, you must just uh, remember that D and theta are matrices uh, that only depend on the step size multipliers. And G1, G2 can be seen as weight matrices and B1, B2 can be seen as uh, biases. So we see that it looks like a neural network, but on the other hand, you will, one could uh, suggest, yeah, okay, it looks like a neural network, but neural networks learn things. This doesn't learn anything. Yes, I know. So in order to make it a real uh, neural network, we assume some things for W. So we suppose that W is a known and learned from a training sequence, let's call it, as a graphic, which, uh, with all these uh, training samples drawn accordingly to uh, an unknown distribution D. So the trainable parameters we have here are the entries of W. And we also assume that W is bounded with respect to the operator norm by some, uh, let's say, lambda uh, positive. And for the rest of the talk, I will simply write uh, that W belongs to that uh, uh, B calligraphic. And now we have uh, some things to work out. So based on this formulation we saw earlier in nine, we formulate ACF as a neural network with L layers or, or iterations. Uh, and in its layer we have these function outputs here in 10 and 11 and as you may notice this sigma here uh, functions are simply the concatenations of the software scolding and truncation operators now we denote the composition of all such layers and all these layers have the same w and this composition written here in 14 and we call this uh, uh, function here the intermediate coder because it simply reconstructs V from Y. So we don't have our X hat yet. I know we're going to, uh, I promise, just wait a little bit uh, more. So this intermediate decoder constitutes the realization of a neural network with any layers. Then we apply an affine map here, phi, so that we can get our x hat eventually. And in order to push our output inside an L2 ball of a uh, specific radius, let's say B uh, out, we also apply uh, truncating a function C uh, on this one. So we're now ready to deliver uh, the desired learnable decoder, which for a fixed number of layers L is given here in 15. We call decoding network, and from now on simply deconnect, the neural network that implements such a decoder, which is also parameterized by the analysis operator W. And we also introduced the hypothesis class of deconnect. I will just call it deco class from now on to uh, for all of you to remember it. So uh, this is the uh, function class here in 16 which basically consists of all these uh, decoders that Deconet can implement. And given Deco class and the training sequence S, Deconet yields a decoder that aims at reconstructing X from Y. So in order to measure the uh, reconstruction error between uh, the original and the, uh, the output of the decoder, we employ the training mean squared error, which is here in 17. And 
there is also another error we are going to see, which is the true loss. Uh, it's actually the loss over the taken over the expectation that the uh, samples uh, are drawn from. And actually, we're interested in the so-called generalization error, which is given as the absolute value between the training missy and the true loss. And generalization error is very important because it tells us how well a neural network performs on its data. So we want to know more things about it. Well, uh, however, we know that the distribution D is, not, is unknown, so we cannot calculate directly. But we can estimate it in terms of uh, a complexity measure called empirical random marker complexity associated to uh, the Jacob class. Here is the random marker complexity uh, and epsilon simply a random marker vector. So in order to estimate empirical random marker complexity, we proceed in a series of steps, which I have stated here. So first, we prove that the uh, function outputs in any layer uh, are bounded. We also prove that the intermediate and the, uh, the final decoder are ellipses continuous with respect to W. We upper bound the covering numbers of deco class, and with this uh, upper bound in hand and employing that list inequality, we eventually can evaluate uh, empirical or the micro complexity. So let's see all these things uh, with more details. Uh, but first, some boundedness assumptions we have on the training sequence. We simply consider uh, uh, the all, all these things uh, to happen. Uh, which are also considered to be standard scenarios in machine learning. And now we have uh, the first lemma uh, around these uh, things. So let's say we have a uh, gay uh, natural number and under certain assumptions on ACX parameters and for any analysis operator uh, which has a bounded operator norm, the function outputs of Deconet in any k layer are up and bounded by quantities that depend on ACS parameters uh, and the operator norm of the measurement matrix and the, uh, the lambda, the upper bound on the operator norm of W. And I guess all these things seem uh, reasonable uh, since uh, all these things are part of the unfolding network. And we also use this lemma in order to prove the ellipsisness of the intermediate decoder I showed to you earlier. So let's say we have again uh, at least uh, two layers, and W is again uh, bounded with respect to the operator norm by some uh, lambda. Uh, again, under certain assumptions on these parameters, the intermediate decoder we saw earlier is lips continuous with respect to uh, the analysis operator. In fact, the Lipschitz constants we have here can be explicitly computed, uh, depend on ACS parameters and the operating norm of A and lambda. And they also have an exponential dependence on the number of layers. And I know this sounds uh, very terrifying, but then things may uh, can become really easier because we're going to take some logarithms and then uh, things uh, won't fall apart <laughs> that easily. So we have all these and we also impose some additional assumptions, which are rather reasonable things uh, to do on step sizes and lambda and this operator norm. So with these additional assumptions, we get a simplified upper bound for the Lipschitz constants, which we will simply call it kappa L. And now that we know that the intermediate decoder is lips continuous, we can also say, say the same for the final learnable decoder. So as you can see here, we have again the ellipsis constants of the previous theorem, but now we also have uh, some extra terms which come from the same formulation of, uh, of phi here. And now that we have uh, Lipschitz and boundedness results, we can proceed to the covering numbers I promised earlier. So we define the set Michael graphic 
here to be simply the set of all realizations of the decoder on the training set. And since, as one may notice, me is parameterized by W exactly the same way a deco class is, we can simply uh, move to estimating the, the micro complexity of me instead of uh, deco class. So in order to have an estimate, we apply that list inequality on this uh, thing here, which uh, basically gives us an upper bound in terms of the covering numbers of uh, the set me. So now, of course, we have to also estimate these covering numbers here, but it's not uh, that uh, big, you know, because uh, I also have I proved this nice lemma here, which gives us an upper bound in terms of the redundancy and the ambient dimension uh, for the set me. And we all we now have all the ingredients we need to cook our main theorems. So that's our first really interesting result because it actually upper bounds the generalization there in terms of all these things we have seen so far. So let's say we have the deco class we saw earlier with overwhelming probability for all the hypotheses in deco class. The generalization error is bounded by a quantity that involves both the uh, upper bounds on the training set, the Lipschitz constants, and some more terms here. And uh, well, as I have uh, told you before, these Lipschitz constants can be calculated explicitly. So we have an explicit formula for all these uh, big thing here. And if we make again some simplifying assumptions like the ones I mentioned earlier in all of my results, we have that the generalization error uh, bound can be simplified to this formulation here where, as you may notice, we again have uh, some quantities we saw earlier. But here, instead of the Lipschitz constants of the intermediate decoder, we have these uh, simplified ones. So uh, this is good because we got rid of many terms. And these P, Q, and R uh, constants uh, uh, are not really important because they don't depend on L and N, and we only interested in these two quantities here, and how they uh, involve, how are they involved in terms of uh, the generalization error. So I set it here a small corollary in informal words. So according to the Lipschitz theorem. Uh, we saw that the number of uh, layers enters at most exponentially in the definition of the simplified Lipschitz constant. So if we consider the dependence of the simplified generalization error bound only on the number of layers, the redundancy, and the number of training samples, and we treat all other terms as constants, we have that the generalization error roughly scales the, the square root of n times L over the, uh, the number of training samples. And now we're going to get our hands a little bit dirty again with some experiments to see how our theory uh, copes with uh, real world settings. So we train the test Deconet on two real world image data sets, uh, which are MNIST and Cypher 10. We consider the vectorized version of images and especially for Cypher 10, we turn them into grayscale. We report the test MSC, which is pretty much as you may imagine the same as uh, the train MSC. But in this case, we take uh, a set of pair test data not used in the training phase. And we also report test MSC because it approximates the true loss. And we also report the empirical generalization error, which is defined as the absolute difference between the test and train MSC. So we use this empirical generalization error, which uh, as you may notice can be explicitly computed to approximate and 
uh, thus evaluate the generalization error. So in the next figures, you're going to see how uh, the test MSC drops and the generalization error increases for increasing values of the number of layers and the redundancy ratio. Here is the MNIST data set for a fixed uh, CS ratio. And here for Cypher 10, and as you can see, the test MSC drops uh, in both cases, which is uh, kind of anticipated because if one considers a standard analysis uh, uh, compressing scenario, uh, the performance and reconstruction quality of the iterative algorithms uh, can be increased as the number of iterations increases and as the redundancy also increases. And you can see that the empirical generalization error seems to scale like the square root of n times l, even though we have some more terms on uh, the generalization error bounds. And here, I uh, did pretty much the same thing as before, but in that case, I took redundancy varying in uh, a set that is not divided by the ambient dimension. And the interesting thing is that for uh, such numbers, uh, it, the performance of Deconet kind of increased in terms that um, the plots uh, produced uh, seem to be a little bit smoother, I'd say. And here again for Cypher 10. And then here I have put a table with uh, the comparisons between all the decoders. Uh, which means between the among the deconnect and on the two best lines. So I have uh, altered the CS ratios and the number of layers and simply put in bold the best performance among all three decoders. So as you can see here, again, deconnect outperforms the rest of them. And here again, I sum up uh, everything I've told you so far. So we saw that the, the what the plot saw us is that the generalization error uh, we took from the experiment seems to scale like the generalization error bound we saw in our theory. In other words, it seems to grow at the rate of a square root of the product between the redundancy of the sparse fire and the number of layers. And it's now time to sum up and see what uh, we could uh, uh, set as a future work. So we derived a new unfolding network, which we called Deconet with L layers. And Deconet jointly learns a decoder for compressed sensing and a redundant sparsifying analysis operator. In fact, we also estimated its generalization error, which roughly scaled like the square root of n times L, employing a chaining technique. And to the best of our knowledge, we are the first that studied the generalization error bound of an unfolding network solving the analysis compressed sensing problem. What we took from numerical experiments is that Teconet outperformed both baselines consistently for all data sets. And luckily, its behavior complied with theory. So as a future work, I would like to characterize in terms of structure, let's say, the learnable sparsifier. And it would be also interesting to study the generalization error bounds of a broader hypothesis class. For example, if we also parameterize it by the step sizes and the smooth parameter, apart from uh, the analysis operator. And here I have also added some references in cases you are interested in some of them. And probably uh, during this week, I'm going to show upload in archive the updated version of uh, my paper around Deconet. And that was all from me. Thank you very much for attending my presentation. All right, thanks so much, Vicky. I'm gonna hit that reaction button. <laughs> Tell Vicky. So we appreciated her great talk. Um, and then uh, Dustin, if you could hit the start.